My name is Jessica, and I am 31 years old. I started my own business at the age of 25, and although it is still small, I run an app development company. My previous job was in the IT field. The company was not a big one, but it was a time when companies were being created one after another. I took the plunge and resigned from my previous company when its management started to lean. Then, I started a smartphone game development company. My husband Tony is a colleague and classmates from my previous company. When I retired, I invited a few people to join me, but my husband stayed. And when I said I was going to start my own business, he was very much against it. Yes, I know. Tony is not the type of person who likes adventure, much less trying new things. He always wants stability. He has no desire to work and is not interested in promotion. He just wants to get by day to day. He has no desire for things, and no hobbies. Compared to Tony, I am the complete opposite. I want to be successful in my work, and I always want to challenge myself. I also like shopping. I enjoy going to live shows of my favorite artist. At first glance, it may seem that we are opposite and that we don't match, but we are not. What they lack in each other. They make up for together. In fact, I think we have good chemistry. We started as an office romance and got married two years ago. And six months ago, we bought the house of our dreams. We knew it would be a once-in-a-lifetime purchase, so we made no compromises at all. We were very particular about the color of the house, white being the base color. And since we both love children, we prepared a room for the child, who would be born in the future. The house is filled with the aroma of wood, and we carefully clean the house every day. Since we moved into the new house, Tony has been saying to me more and more, "I want to have a child as soon as possible." Jessica, if you keep working, you will be left behind. You see on social networking sites that everyone has kids. You know that, don't you, Jessica? My parents are rushing me to have kids as well. Why don't you save your work for a while? This was my biggest fear. Tony's income has decreased significantly. Many people left the company for that reason, and now there are only three employees, including Tony. And the vacation is called remote work. This month, he only went to work a few times. Before I knew it, his salary was reduced to an hourly rate, like a part-time job. We bought a house with a mortgage, and we can hardly live on my husband's income alone. But the issue of income is a sensitive one, so there was no way I could tell him directly. So I kept my mouth shut. Tony also noticed that his income was decreasing. But he turned away from his new job. I responded, choosing my words carefully. I guess so, but I still want to focus on my work. I want to save more money. If I have a child, of course I want to think about the child first. I don't have anyone I can trust completely when I'm out of the office. So, I'm sorry. Please wait a little longer. I'll think about it. Tony looks unhappy. You know, my mother is always asking to see her grandchildren. I'm sorry, but you've got to think about my dignity too. You know, I've told my mother that Jessica is unable to have children because she is too picky. She won't be convinced if I don't say so. I knew that too. Every time my mother-in-law looked at me, she would say, "Are you not ready yet, Jessica?" Work is good, but you have to have a child before you can be a full-fledged man. You know, no matter how good you are at your job, a woman who cannot produce offsprings is half a man. Be a full-fledged woman soon. There is no way I can agree with such an opinion. But my mother-in-law is stubborn, 
and rigid women. I could not expect Tony, who is a mother's son, to take my side, even if I gave him my opinion. I was tired from work, so I tried to avoid seeing her as much as possible. Whenever we met, she would talk about our children. She probably doesn't know about my husband's income. I don't think she could ever think of having children if she saw our current financial situation. One Sunday, I was relaxing, trying to spend the holiday with my husband. When the chime rang, my mother-in-law was there through the monitor. I really wanted to use the answering machine, but it was not possible because we had a car. My husband opened the door, and as soon as he opened it, she turned to me and said in a sarcastic tone, "You've embarrassed me, Jessica." Naturally, I had no idea what she was talking about. I had just bumped into a friend of mine from school. She told me that she has three grandchildren. He is younger than Tony. She bragged about her grandchildren. I never thought I would be subjected to such humiliations at my age. Having a wife who is a piece of shit, I must be miserable like this. She turns her anger toward me. Don't you feel sorry for Tony too? You are not going to be young forever, so you need to plan your future properly. You talk about work and work and work, but you are just making games. Anyone can do that, not just you. Ignorant people are the scariest. They don't know anything about other people's hard work, but they are the ones who are taken advantage of. As you can imagine, I couldn't stay silent either. With all due respect, I think you should be aware of your ignorance. I understand that you want to see your grandchildren, and I'm sorry for you felt sad. But I can't keep quiet about my job. It is not a job that just anyone can do. It is unpleasant to hear people talk like that about a game that our employees work hard every day to make. When I said that, my mother-in-law laughed slightly. What are you trying to be so cool about? Is that your game more important or your child? Which is it? If the nerdy games is still important to you, it makes sense. It's such a ridiculous story, isn't it? I had been avoiding this because I didn't want to get in trouble, and now I am getting revenge. It makes my head hurt. What is it? Which is more important, that job or me? Such nonsense! It's ridiculous to compare such things, and they are completely different vectors, aren't they? I understand what you're trying to say, but from this point on, it's a married couple's story. Please let us come to a conclusion together. I thought my words were a little too strong, but I couldn't stay silent any longer. Tony never defended me and kept silent. Then my mother-in-law, her face bright red, sniffles and comes at me. You must feel bad for me, right? Tony is too kind to say anything. Don't you think it would be worse if he worked harder than you? I get it. I feel sorry for Tony. I'll live here too. You're building a nursery, even though you can't even have a child. If you don't want to have kids. Don't you have that extra room? You are infertile, and we will have plenty of room in a four-bedroom. I'll move in with you. I was gasping at what she was going to say this time, when Tony opened his mouth. It's true. There's plenty of room, isn't it? I don't want to have kids, so it will be more efficient for me to live with my mother. Jessica is careless. It's good to have someone at home for security. I agree. I was surprised by his statement. I know Tony is a mom's boy, but I didn't think he would go so far out of control without asking my opinion. I was angry too, so I sarcastically said to Tony, "Tony, you are at home because of the remote work. 
I think the security is perfect. If I needed security, I would have hired a professional company to do it. I don't have anything expensive enough to need security. What kind of house are you talking about, Tony? He looked annoyed and turned on me. Can't you see? That kind of attitude discourages me. Jessica's success in becoming independent was just a fluke, wasn't it? Even if I had started my own business at that time, I would have been successful. I would have made a lot of money. The heat in my body quickly cooled down. To tell you the truth, Tony, you can't do it. You've had so many chances to give up on this company. You can't even make your own decisions. It's not that easy to run a company if you can't make a decision on your own. Employees won't follow a boss who doesn't do his job. Tony looks just like his mother-in-law and gets angry at me. You are really an arrogant and not very pretty woman. If she can't even have children, she's a failure as a person. Do you understand? Life has to be passed on to the next generation in a relay system. So if you can't have more than two children from me and Jessica, it will lead to a decrease in the population. My mom is right. If you can't listen to her, who is a senior in your life, then you're not worth talking to. You're polishing your arrogance too much. You should live with my mother and let her teach you about that. No one else is going to teach you anything. You need to have your morals drilled into you as a human being. He is saying this in a very righteous way. But I never said I didn't want children in the first place. I just didn't want to have children because there is no way I can live on Tony's earnings alone. In order to protect my mother-in-law's reputation, I've kept quiet about it. But I'm going to reveal it. Please, look at this. Can you say that my arrogance is the reason why we don't have children? With that, I produced a household account book and my husband's and my pay stubs. My mother-in-law stared at it with a mousy expression. And Tony looked impatient. I knew it would be tough for him to show this to her. Because his salary is only as much as a student's part-time job. With this amount of money, he would have to pay the mortgage and be the mainstay of the family. It is impossible. I opened my mouth. As you can see, our family's financial situation is made up of two people working. I can't think about my children just yet because I don't want them to be miserable or poor. If I want to continue my marriage with Tony, I have to give up now. Then, Tony says with an impatient look on his face. I didn't ask you to show mom your paycheck. Do you really enjoy making me look bad? Then his mother said, A man's income is not everything, you know. Tony's mild-mannered personality makes him a good father. Why don't you be the mainstay of the family? I'm going to fall over. No, no, no. When he's at home, he only reads comic books and plays phone games. If Tony was a housemate, that would make sense. And you know, the women are the only ones who can have children, right? If I take a leave of absence for six months, this house will go bankrupt. They are speechless when I said that. My mother-in-law is puckering her mouth like a goldfish. I continue. I think it would be more fun to have kids, and I would grow up. But a man is only a man, if he has the financial resources to support his family. I think that's a perfect score, if we both earn good money. But I don't agree with your way of thinking. Tony was furious, and starts yelling at me. Jessica's speriality is ruining me. I have a bus all the way home. Get out of my house. I don't even want to see your face anymore. My mother-in-law is biting at me too. That's right. Who do you think you are to say what you want to say? Fine. I'm going to get the divorce papers. Donnie, 
divorce this piece of shit wife of yours. With that, the two went to the city office together. Why I have to leave is a mystery. But I don't want to be with Tony anymore. I don't even want to see his face. That's my line. I'm running out of patience too. I'm finally ready to leave home. I'm going to take this opportunity to pack my things. I don't like to have a lot of stuff to begin with. Basically, I don't want to have anything in my room. I am what is commonly known as minimalist. Packing was over in no time. My mother in law and Tony are in an angry mood and are filling out the divorce papers as soon as they came home. Tony slapped me with it. I've already filled it out. It's now or never if you want to hold me back. No matter how much you apologize, if you file for divorce, you never get it back. I am not going to be able to go to work tomorrow because of the mental anguish you've caused me. So, give me this house instead of alimony. You make a lot of money, so I'm sure you can afford it. Well, if you apologize, I'll forgive you. He wants me to hold off. I have never met such a small man. He is number one in my generation. I will fill out the divorce papers without hesitation. After a while, the divorce was successfully finalized. I often hear that divorce is more difficult than marriage, but it was easier than I had expected. And it was refreshing. I would like to praise myself for living in such a miserable way. For the time being, I decided to stay at the office. All the employees knew that the president would do this someday. They are laughing at me. But here comes my payback. I am not a good natured person who would pay the mortgage on a house that belongs to someone I hate. There's no reason for me to pay alimony to Tony in the first place. That's right, the house is in my name. Of course, I couldn't get the loan with Tony's salary. After all, I put the house in my name. Therefore, I am the owner. I don't need this house anymore. And I asked my lawyer to join the case to avoid any trouble later on. The common property of the couple will be split 50 50. Of course, the house will be sold. It is still in a period of time when it can't be called a new house. I was very happy that it sold for the asking price right away. And for some reason, without any evidence, They thought they could continue to live in the house. My mother in law seems to have learned here the fact that the house is in my name only after the divorce. Tony had lied about the amount of his income. So it is not surprising that my mother in law thought so. When they found out that the house was sold, they turned pale. Then my mother in law called me. Do you really enjoy causing us so much trouble? Tony is going to get back together with you. So you have to withdraw the sales right now. My mother in law is yelling at me. Huh? Get him back? I'm sorry, but no matter how much you pile on, I refuse. I am already a stranger. Then I'll come to your office right now and spread the word about the fact that you were a bad person. Please do as you please. I'm busy. So please, excuse me. I hang up the phone and immediately reported the matter to the company's exclusive lawyer. The lawyer came. But even though I waited at the company, she never came. I've submitted the voice recorder of the calls when the divorce was discussed and now to my lawyer. He said it was more than enough material to get alimony. I was in the habit of recording on the voice recorder because of my job. What I am concerned about here is the financial situation of my mother in law and Tony. My mother in law has never kept a job. On a contrary, they lost their house. At the same time, the company Tony worked for went bankrupt. Tony became unemployed. They look for a good paying job, but they don't have a career. So there is no way they can get one. They have no savings to begin with. So, Tony started working as a part timer for a day job. And then I had a lawyer come in. 
they bowed down to their relatives and borrowed money to pay the fee in one lump sum. The lawyer was very surprised. And I cannot stay in the office forever. I need a space where I can rest. Come to think of it, I haven't felt at ease at home recently. I took the plunge and bought a condominium near my office. I live alone, so I decided to focus on security. My experience with the divorce led me to develop a love simulation game for adults. It was a bigger hit than I had expected. It became the company's signature game, and I still love my job. My husband demanded a divorce right after I gave birth. I planned to destroy him and his company. Finally gave birth to a son after 12 years of marriage. I remember how happy I was to see him squealing so energetically that my exhaustion flew away. A few hours after the birth of my son, my husband and mother-in-law came to my hospital room. We saw the baby. He's so cute, just like Mark. Good job. Our baby is a boy. They looked content. When I told them about my pregnancy, I was worried about their indifferent attitudes. But seeing their cheerful faces assured me that their own child or grandchild was adorable. I hoped that we might be able to have happy days like in the past. So, we're getting a divorce. My husband initiated the divorce, as if it were a casual conversation. It was followed by my mother-in-law. Well, we'll take the air. She said it with a smile on her face, not changing her demeanor. You're no longer needed. I've taken care of you for over a decade, so don't complain now. It's way too late to have the first child after twelve years of marriage. He should switch to a younger girl, who can bear more children. I don't want to waste any more time with you, so divorce me right away. Okay, then I'll destroy your home and company. My name is Sally. I'm a thirty-four-year-old housewife. My husband Mark and I started dating. Back in the university, when we were students, we were an ordinary couple. I thought he was just like me, from an ordinary family. But after we engaged, I learned that his grandfather was a wealthy man, who owned several companies. Moreover, they were so big that everyone knew about them. I was anxious about my marriage, thinking it was too much to be the wife of someone from such a family. But Mark said, "It's no different than any other family. Just that my grandfather is a business owner. He was a kind guy who always considered me. So I thought I could work things out with him, and decided to marry him. After marriage, Mark and my mother-in-law Helen wanted me to live on a property and be a full-time housewife. Mark got a job at an ordinary company." So life was mostly normal for us, except that I struggled to learn table manners when I had to go to a high-class restaurant for family gatherings. After the third year of our marriage, Helen, who had always left us couple alone, started interfering. It's already been three years, but no baby yet. Mrs. Miller's daughter just got pregnant. I wonder when I can meet my grandchild. She came over early in the morning and urged me to have a baby every day. I spoke to Mark about this. She's been lonely ever since my dad passed away. We'll have a kid someday, so don't take it too seriously. He told me to be patient. I should have retorted to her, or blatantly asked Mark to tell her to stop. But I felt so bad about not being able to have a baby myself that I couldn't come on strong. Many years has passed, but still no baby. Meanwhile, her demand to have a grandchild got more intense. Not only that, 
she started harassing me about my chores, criticizing my cooking and throwing the food away, and ordering me to finish the mowing the yard within an hour. Once I told Mark that I was tired of the attacks from his mother and wanted him to do something about it. Deal with it yourself. I'm tired, so don't bother me with such a trivial matter. He interrupted me and scolded me with a sigh. Around this time, he was busy establishing a company affiliated with his grandfather's, and was to become the president. He was coming home late at night frequently, not only to work, but also to socialize and drink. And when I tried to talk to him, most of the time he was too exhausted to listen to me. The numbers of occasions we spoke to each other became less and less, and our relationship, as a married couple, was diminishing. Even so, I thought that if Mark's work settled down, and we had a child, we could go back to the days when we were close. So, I started infertility treatment. During the treatment, I often felt tired. And couldn't do what I wanted, and was also anxious that I wouldn't be able to have a child. It was mentally and physically exhausting, but I somehow managed to hang on, dreaming of a happy life for our family. As a result, we were finally able to have a child after 12 years of marriage. When the doctor told me I was pregnant, I wanted to jump up and down for joy. I called Mark right away. Are you busy? Sorry to bother you. I just saw the doctor, and I'm pregnant. Oh, good. I'm busy right now, so I have to go. His reaction was so cold that my high spirits disappeared. When I told Helen, finally, I thought I wasn't going to have a grandchild. There was no words of joy. Or no congratulations, but only the reaction I didn't expect. So I was quite disappointed. Even after the news, Helen didn't stop harassing me, but continued ordering me to clean her house and stealing the meal I prepared, which added more burden on my shoulders. Mark was still coming home late, and we didn't have time to talk. My feelings started wavering. Around this time, should I get a divorce? But we might reconcile after the baby is born. A half a year later, I gave birth to my son. I remember how happy I was to see him squealing so energetically that my exhaustion flew away. I would have loved to have Mark with me there, but I told myself that he was too busy. He and Helen came to visit me. A few hours later, I was surprised to see them both, as they never said they were coming. But I didn't say anything, thinking they were just rushing in to celebrate the birth. We saw the baby; it's so cute, just like Mark. Good job, our baby is a boy. They looked content. When I told them about my pregnancy. I was worried about their indifference, but seeing their cheerful faces reassured me that their own child or grandchild was adorable. I hoped that we might be able to have happy days like in the past. So, we're getting a divorce. Mark initiated the divorce, as if it were a casual conversation. It was followed by Helen. We'll take the air. She said it with smile on her face, not changing her demeanor. What are you talking about? I just gave birth to your son, and you're talking about a divorce? You're no longer you are no longer needed. I've taken care of you for over a decade, so don't complain now. It's way too late to have the first child after twelve years of marriage. I can't expect to have more grandkids from someone over thirty, like you. He should switch to a prettier and younger girl, who can bear more children. 
my mouth was agape from such a shock, and they thought I was incapable to fight back. They continued with their selfish claim. I guess you'll be struggle to make ends meet. After being a housewife for over ten years, I'll be lenient with the child support. You can thank us for raising your son later. He's a precious heir. When they finished talking, they walked out of the room with satisfied looks on their faces. All I could think about was how to make him regret his decision in my quiet hospital room. Not once did I consider avoiding a divorce, which convinced me that my love for him was gone. After my mind was made up, I called my parents and asked them to pick me up upon my discharge. I assumed my son would be taken away from me if I returned home. I didn't want to worry my parents more than necessary, so I simply informed them that I was getting a divorce. I sent a text to Mark and Helen that I wasn't well, and was going to stay with my parents for a while. Helen replied with complaints, but Mark simply wrote back, "Okay." I wasn't sure if he thought it would be too hard to take care of an infant, but if he thought I wouldn't get away from him, but I was relieved that he didn't object. Although I was wary, they never came to the hospital. Or my parents' house again. While my mother was taking care of my son, I decided to call my grandfather-in-law to retaliate against Mark. I knew it was brazen of me to rely on him, but to weaken Mark and Helen's position with an extended family, and to get me a lawyer, I decided it was necessary. It was my very first time calling him. So I was anxious while the phone was ringing. When he answered my call, I told him about what happened during my pregnancy, and what I had been told by them right after I gave birth. I also forwarded the nasty messages I received from Helen, and hinted to him that Mark probably had a mistress, from the way she mentioned switching to a younger girl. He couldn't make a decision. Based on my story alone, so he was going to investigate, and then call me back on another day. I received a call from him a week later. From his investigation, he found that Mark had been cheating on me for three years, and Helen had been telling people that I had run away, and she was raising her grandson. My grandfather-in-law sounded stoic. But I could feel his quiet rage vibrating through the phone. To gather more evidence of adultery, I found a private detective to tell Mark, and my grandfather-in-law referred me to a seasoned lawyer. The more and more evidence of infidelity came out. His mistress was a gentle-looking girl in her early twenties. There were pictures of Mark going into her apartment. Of him happily arm in arm with her, and of them going into our house together, there was a picture of the girl chatting with my mother-in-law. So she must have known about the affair. I was ready to retaliate. When my health was back to normal, Mark and I decided to discuss our divorce. We met in the meeting room at his company. Mark and Helen. Were already seated when I showed up with my lawyer. Where's my grandson? You never let me see him since his birth. Helen grimaced at me. He's with my parents. You are too clumsy, and not the best at raising a child. So give him to me now. You hide in your parents' house and bring a lawyer with you. I was going to let you go without child support and alimony, but if you're willing to fight, I'll be thorough, too. What do you mean by alimony? I'm going to take over my grandfather's company one day, and yet I took care of a childless woman for over a decade, so it wouldn't be worth it. 
if I didn't get alimony. Mark sneered, and my lawyer looked at him coldly. I wonder which one of us would end up paying alimony. Huh? Look who's talking. Helen, let me check again. I'm having a hard time having kids, and I'm not getting any younger. So you want Mark to marry a younger girl? Right? You're not so bright, and have no awareness of what kind of family you married into. We need a healthy, obedient, child-bearing bride. Do you agree with her, Mark? Sure. I don't want to waste any more time with you. Let's divorce as fast as we can. Both of them said exactly what I wanted them to say, which made me grin. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Now I'm going to destroy you and your company. Huh? Huh? They rolled their eyes at each other, and then burst out in laughter. You? Who do you think you are so succeed doing such a thing? His company is affiliated with his grandfather. You were born and raised in a poor family. There's no way you could do that. They continued to mock me for a while. Well, let's have a look at these first. I presented them with dozens of pictures on the table. Both of them immediately shut off their laugh. And became serious when they saw them. So, what are they got to do with us? You may be mistaken. This woman is my friend from the university, and I was just being consulted about her career. I see. Then how about these? I pulled out a voice recorder and played a conversation between him and his mistress about their honeymoon and married life. Both Mark and Helen turned pale when they heard the recording. What the hell is this? I got nothing to do with it. I hid a voice recorder in the house while you two were gone a few days ago. By the way, I bought it to get evidence of Helen's harassment. I expected Mark to deny everything when I showed him the pictures. So. I installed the voice recorder to make sure they couldn't get away with it. But, but we've been separated since you went back to your parents' house. So our marriage is being broken. We haven't been separated. I just went back home after the baby was born. In any case, I know you've been seeing her for three years. I have proof. That's a lie. Show me if you do. I met up with your mistress. I asked her to meet me since I had an impression that she might not know he was married. After hearing the recorded conversation, I was right. She was aghast and on the verge of tears when she found out. She led me to read the correspondence between Mark and her. I'm lonely right after a divorce. Will you accept me even though I'm a divorcee? There were several messages about him being single. I had taken pictures of those as proof of their affair. He was speechless after I showed them to him. It's disgusting that you're not only cheating on me, but also deceiving her by not telling the truth. I wonder what the people at work would think if they knew about this. You think you were threatening me with that? How could a company go out of business over something as trivial as cheating? Right. So it's okay that he has been listening. I showed him a screen on my phone, which had been on the line with my grandfather-in-law. Mark and Helen suddenly looked agitated and couldn't say anything other than, "No, wait. He's too busy to join us here." But he was concerned about me, so he has listening over the phone. He also helped me to get the evidence of your adultery. As soon as Mark heard me, he fell to the floor. I am very sorry. Um, this is just a small marital dispute. 
When he started, ex- when he started excusing, his grandfather scolded. A man who failed a woman, he promised to protect, wasn't capable of running a company. He said he was going to discipline Mark later, and hang up the phone. Mark was still on the floor, frozen like a statue. Helen was pale as a ghost. Now, you know you can't get away with it. So, let's discuss child support and alimony. I was content to see the despair on Mark and Helen's faces. So I was going to let my lawyer take charge, and wrap up the negotiation quickly. Let's not get divorced after all. The child should be with the birth mother. Drenched in his cold sweat, he suggested with a quivering smile. I laughed at his awkward expression and said, "You're right." His face immediately turned to a natural smile. My son needs a mother, but he doesn't need a father like you. Let me say it from me. This time, you're no longer needed. So, please divorce me. Showing the despair on his face, he held his head with both hands. My lawyer and I ignored him and continued the discussion. It didn't reach an argument on that day, and Mark also hired a lawyer. As a result, I was granted alimony of a hundred k as I wished. The only reason I got what I wanted was that there was no property of division. Mark was earning a good amount of money, but when he was put in charge of the company, he became carefree and bought suits and watches of prestigious brands. I asked once if he was saving, and he said now was the time to spend, and he kept splurging. I suspected that he wasn't saving, and just as I thought, his account balance was only a few hundred dollars. As there were no savings, Mark and Helen had cashed in numerous brands' name items to pay alimony, but it still wasn't enough, and ended up selling their house. They moved into a small apartment and started a new lives. His company loved affiliation with his grandfather, and the companies he was dealing with pulled out, so he went bankrupt. The employee who lost their jobs were taken in by his grandfather. He managed to find a new job, but his salary became half of what he used to make. It was impossible to make a proper living. So Helen, who had been housewife, needed work—a part-time job. The two incomes should have been enough to make a living for them, but Mark needed to pay child support, and both of them couldn't downgrade their lifestyle. So the amount of debt kept increasing. I heard Helen ask for help from her relatives. They didn't even decline, but ignored her completely. My recording of her harassment, that was passed around among them, seemed to be effective. It's been a year since the divorce. Mark has never asked to see his son. I wonder if he wants to, but he can't even pay his phone bill. That there's no way for him to get in touch with me. Either way, my son and I are enjoying our peaceful lives, without having to deal with him and Helen. I can't imagine raising my son together with them. I'm grateful now that Mark initiated a divorce. My husband of 20 years denied adultery. When I brought the evidence to the court, his face went white. My name is Annie, 47 years old. Since I got married, I had been taking care of my husband, who had never done chores as a housewife. I met John, who was turning 50 this year, at the hospital I worked. It was a common story, a nurse-patient relationship. When his discharge was announced, he asked me out. He was good-looking and well-spoken, and knew how to treat a woman. I was still naive back then, and immediately fell for him. We had smooth sailing into the marriage afterward. Unfortunately, we weren't blessed with children. 
and our conversation diminished later in the marriage. But we still went out for special dinners to celebrate birthdays and anniversary. We weren't lovey dovey, but an ordinarily middle aged couple. Hmm, again? I sighed disapprovingly in the kitchen. John had been coming home late these few months. He often went to work on weekends too, so our very existing couple time was becoming non existent. I stared at an empty notification on my phone. He looked tech savvy, but he was actually lagged behind and used a senior phone, which of course had messaging apps, email, and call functions. He didn't even have a Nokia before, but he willingly decided to get a smartphone, saying it must have been inconvenient for me. He wanted to master the phone, so he was training himself even in the bathroom for the first six months. Considering that it was a waste of the phone if he didn't use it for the purpose. Not hearing from him didn't mean I could go ahead and finish my dinner. He would have no doubt said, Where's my dinner? On the other hand, if I prepared food, I already had dinner. It was a dilemma. I didn't mean to complain to a husband who came home exhausted from work. It was just a bit sad to have the leftover for my lunch the next day when I cooked it for him with love and care. One day, I got into our car to go shopping. It was normally used as John's private property, which he took to work on weekdays and sometimes on weekends, so I rarely had a chance to drive it. He was unusually at home that day. While he was still sleeping, I planned to drive a supermarket that was having a big sale far out of town. I switched on the navigation and was stunned to see the list of histories. What the heck? Cafe Kitty and Sunrise Aquarium? Wait a minute, I've never been to those places. Moreover, it had been a month since I was in the car last time. I felt the cold sweat running down on my spine. When I found many other histories that didn't sound work related, I breathed in deep to calm myself down. I took a picture of the screen with my trembling hands. It was 8 a.m. John had come back wasted from a business entertainment at around 1 a.m. He was still in his deep slumber, snoring away. It was the only chance. I liked watching crime dramas. And my favorite characters were crime scene investigators. I pretended to be one and bent over to check under the seat and trash meticulously. I found a long string of curly brown hair and a tiny gold earring in a crack in the seat. Yes, secured, not my hair. I kept my hair short, which was easier to take care of, and John and I didn't have our ears pierced. I felt too anxious to drive, so I canceled shopping. Once I returned inside the house, I started cooking like nothing ever happened. It had been 20 years since I became a housewife. I normally prepared two types of breakfast ironed John's shirts and handkerchief, polished his leather shoes every night, and cooked a healthy dinner, and etc. I had mastered everything he wished me to do. Yet he betrayed me. I was humiliated and didn't want to believe it. A short while later, John got up. Morning. Which one would you like, a smoothie bowl or eggs and bacon? I had too much to drink last night, so I will have a smoothie bowl. I left a newspaper on a dining table. I served breakfast in front of him, who was reading the papers with a TV noise in the background. I go through the trouble of preparing two different meals. What a nice wife I was! It was a usual breakfast scene. I sat down across from him, pretending to be calm. Hum, can I borrow the car today? I want to go to a supermarket out of town for the big sale. Are you sure? You haven't driven for a long time. I will be fine. I will use the navigation. I don't trust you. I will go instead. I smiled at him, who spoke cautiously as if he was choosing the right words. Let's go together then. Okay. I will clean the car after I finish here. You get ready. 
He folded the papers haphazardly and gulped his breakfast in a rush. He was still wearing his night robe when I saw him run out of the house. I waited for the front door to close, and then I put the hair and piercing in the Ziploc bag with the date and time, and hid in the back of the cupboard. I went out with John for the first time in months that day. The car was vacuumed, and there wasn't a single speck of dust inside. When I started the navigation, the history had been deleted. I thought to myself that I would let it go this time for not having enough evidence, but there wasn't going to be a second time. I glared at John, who was strangely nice to me in my mind. Things were peaceful for the next few weeks until my birthday. It was when the unexpected happened. John was going to get off of work early. And we were supposed to have dinner together. I booked the French in the mall at 8:30 tonight. Don't be late. I reminded him while preparing breakfast, but he gave me a half-hearted groan. Maybe he didn't get enough sleep from coming home late again last night. Since the shopping day, he must have reflected on himself because he started letting me know when he was going to be late. Thanks to that. I stopped having a dilemma about his dinner, but the lateness remained the same. It made me concerned about his health from overwork. I dressed up for the occasion and went out to the restaurant at night. It was located about 15 minutes by taxi, and was at the quiet corner on the upper floor of the mall. I was seated in the back by the large window, looking out to the parking lot. I texted John and then ordered an aperitif. He didn't reply to my text. After thirty minutes of waiting, I finally called him. When he answered after ringing for a while, he sounded bothered. Yeah, what's up? Hey, where are you? I texted that I was waiting for you at the restaurant. Oh yeah, my bad. I'm slammed at work and can't make it. What? What do you mean? You always got off on time for special occasions. You could have let me know earlier if you couldn't make it. He clicked his tongue as if to say celebrating his wife's birthday was a nuisance. I didn't even have time to do that. I'm working, unlike you who is at home doing whatever you like. Anyway, I can't leave tonight. Cancel the dinner. Got it? Bye. Wait a minute. When I was about to hold him back, he had already hung up on me. It wasn't any day but my birthday. As I gave in, I called my waiter to explain the mishap, and told him that I would pay for the pre-booked course. He kindly suggested having dinner alone and just paying for myself. As I contemplated, my phone pinged with a text from John. Did you cancel? I was upset with a one-line text without an apology. I sent back a bitter reply, "Yeah, just your part." Then I turned to the waiter, "I will take up on your suggestion, please. Even if I went back home now, there was nothing to eat. Since it was a hump day, the restaurant was only half full. I decided to enjoy my birthday French dinner alone in quiet." I even planned to post my complaints and pictures on social media. Then, I had been just looking through it almost every day, but that's how it was supposed to be used. John had no interest or knowledge in social media, and it was frustrating sometimes. But I was glad then he was not good at IT in general. I enjoy a beautiful course, tasting every bite and swallowing down with my frustration. I stared out of the window with the tipsy eyes, just looking at the cars in the parking. Then I saw a familiar one among them, John's car. A stranger walked toward it. I was totally stunned by what my eyes saw in the next few seconds: an elegantly dressed young woman with an unmatched supermarket Echo bag, and long curly hair got in the car so naturally. The alcohol in me evaporated in a second. I scurried to record on my phone, but it was too late. The car drove away in the opposite direction from our home. There was a strip of bars and an old bowling alley in that direction, 
and also a motel. My anger started to simmer. It was a moment that turned what had been vague to clear. My phone got a ping. John wrote, I will be back in two hours, no need for dinner. It was a familiar message, but since I caught the scene, it just angered me even more. I should have made him sorry the other day. It was my fault for giving him a benefit of doubt. I quickly paid my bill and got in a taxi to home. I tried to call John several times, but he never picked up. I texted him to come home soon, and as soon as I got back in the house, I threw my phone on the sofa. I waited for a while for him. Then he finally showed up carrying his usual demeanor and passed me a supermarket echo back. Hey, sorry to miss the dinner. This is for you. Inside a big bag, there was a piece of cake with a discounted price tag. If it was a normal time, I could have laughed, but I was fuming instead. What were you doing? Huh? I was working. What kind of work is picking up a young girl and driving away? What? I threw back the bag with a cake at him. I went to grab the ziplock from the cupboard and then shove it into him. I found these in your car. You are cheating on me. I want a divorce. He was flustered and I was determined to get the truth. But I was astounded by what he had said next. What are you talking about? Where is your proof? What? Here, this is. And? He shouted at me so loud. I flinched, to which he grinned as if to say he won. I guess these were from the colleague I gave a right to once. What I'm asking is if you have evidence that I'm having an affair. I saw unusual histories on your car navigation. I took a picture of it. And I saw you tonight. I only canceled your part and had my dinner there. I saw from the window your car picking up a woman in the parking. He deliberately let out a long sigh. What you saw on the navigation is from when I was looking for a place to take you. And a car you saw wasn't mine tonight. Yes, it was. Show me your proof. If you insist, you must have a picture. No. The moment I hesitated, he punched a wall. You get hysterical and accuse me of cheating when I'm so tired from work. And even disregard me for doing at least I can do. How can you be like that without concrete evidence? You should be ashamed of yourself. His outburst left me speechless. Seeing me stunned, he sat back on the sofa as if he was done with it. I'm not giving you a divorce. I want to take a bath. Get to it now. You better not forget to polish my shoes too. Fine. I knew it was pointless to argue with him. As soon as I turned my back to him, I heard his chuckles. The twenty years we got built together were falling apart. At the same time, my feelings toward John were freezing. I could only feel my anger and frustration. I carried out the tasks he had demanded in silence, and then, when he had fallen asleep, I packed basic things, took a spare key to the car, and left the house. It was dawn when I got to my parents' house. I explained my situation to them, who welcomed me back without a question. A few hours after I arrived, John called me. You! Where are you? You're the worst wife! Just taking off like that! It wouldn't have happened if you weren't having an affair. Drop it! I'm not divorcing you! Come back now! You are supposed to take care of me for the rest of your life! Something in me exploded. I was just a useful servant to him. His servant called the affair, but she wasn't supposed to meddle with it. If he didn't want to come out clean, then I had a plan. I was going to make him regret not owning up to his responsibility. Okay, I will get a lawyer. You will hear from him soon. I hung up before he could say anything. I wasn't gonna let him get away with it easily at this point. It made no sense to not demand alimony for adultery. I squeezed my phone tightly and called an office of a private detective. 
The day of the arbitration arrived a few weeks later. Of course, I had prepared well with my lawyer for this. John, on the other hand, was going to present himself. It was a great turn of the event for me. He must have thought that he could easily pressure me to submit to him like the other day, but I wasn't going to let that happen. I knew how well spoken he was than anyone else. The arbitrator wasn't supposed to be influenced, but who knew if John wasn't going to try? I gladly accepted to face him. He showed up looking quite disheveled at the meeting. His shirt and pants were wrinkled, and shoes were unpolished. It seems his mistress wasn't good at chores as I expected. The second he noticed me, he called out my name desperately and blubbered his love to me. Living alone must have gotten to his head. It was such a performance of his life. The arbitrator was astounded and watched him for a little while. When I knocked her with a cough, she finally silenced John. She asked me to present first. But it was John who opened his mouth. I quietly stopped her, who tried to quiet him. He declared his love and his faithfulness to me. He never cheated, was in love with me, and we always celebrated our anniversary over a special dinner. John's tearful plea was mixed with fact, which made it sound somehow realistic. I was quite annoyed. When the arbitrator finished with John, she turned to me. Now, can you please present your case? There was untruth in John's claim, his adultery. I had done the best I could to take care of him. His adultery is a betrayal. I ask for a divorce, that's all. I told you I never cheated on you. You better prove it. He really wanted to see the evidence. I was ready to give them to him. Firstly, please take a look at this. This is a picture of the car navigation histories that gave me suspicion in the first place. It's a print out of the picture. I also found a string of hair and piercing in the car on the same day. And John smirked at the evidence as the arbitrator wasn't looking at him. I opened my PC and faced the screen toward the arbitrator and John. This is a social media account of John's mistress. Huh? It seems like he has hidden his marital status from her, so she has been posting every outing with him. John's smirk disappeared. The arbitrator stretched her arms toward my PC. Um, may I? Sure, please. The arbitrator scrolled a page as she inspected the post. It was just a lucky guess. I realized that most of the car navigation histories was a photogenic spot. I thought there might be pictures of John and his mistress in the background and searched social media with a little hope. I didn't have a gut to contact a private detective at that point. I was just looking for any proof. As I expected, there was a large amount of data, and I finally found an account after consuming a lot of spare time I had as a housewife. There was a post with a comment. I went for a drive with my mature boyfriend. I'm sad to lose my piercing though. Let me know if someone finds it. She considerably uploaded a picture of the same piercing I had found in the car. The owner of the account had the same style of hair and the same coat she wore when I first saw her. There were other contents that fit perfectly with the histories of car navigation, and some images with a figure of John without the face. I was certain it was his mistress. Too bad I already had hired a detective at this point. Well, the moment I found this, I immediately informed him. The arbitrator looked at John coldly. This is not an affair. It's strictly a business relationship on my side. She's the one misunderstood the fact. I ignored his excuses and produced more evidence. Dozens of pictures that came from my detective were laid out on the table. John didn't need to excuse himself anymore after I left, so he seemed to take the opportunity to spread his wings. I heard it was so easy to take pictures of him, such as going into a motel room, visiting his mistress at her house, and taking her into our home. 
Most of all, there was one picture that caught my eye. I mumbled "wolf" and showed the image. A 50-year-old middle-aged man with a collar and leash was ecstatically worked by a young woman in a park. The arbitrator clearly showed her disgust. Every time John rushed to grab the nighttime walk photo, I retrieved another one taken from various angles. I looked into his eyes and said, "Woof, woof! Stop it! They are not for your entertainment." So should I send these to your office? No! Wait, wait, wait! And now here's another one. If I may comment, you shouldn't use the car as a motel room. I showed the result of a lab test. I gave the spare key to my detective and had him swap the seats in the car. As expected, there were bodily fluids that validated his adultery. Or do you guys like to drive around without your underwear? Either way, it would be wise not to. I smiled at John, who was red-faced and trembling. Did you enjoy the evidence? Shell shocked. He muttered some swear words and hung his head in despair. A poor puppy. From then on, the arbitration proceeded decent manner. In addition to the division of property, it was decided that I was also to receive a hefty alimony payment for his betrayal in a long-standing marriage. I expected that. After everything was decided, John blurted out something. I will let you have a divorce. Even after paying you all that, I still got a house. I will marry my young and pretty girlfriend. We'll live a modest life, and she would slowly but surely learn to take care of the house. What are you talking about? She's leaving you. Huh? When she posted about the relationship on the social media, it's obvious that she is dating you without knowing you're married. I mean, who would make such brazen posts knowing her boyfriend is married? Her contact information was easily obtained on social media. I reached out to her through the detective before arbitration. She was told by John that he had a girlfriend he wanted to leave and had no idea he was married. He just wanted to show off to the public. My mature boyfriend is hot and confirm her status in society. Well, if she knew the truth, she wouldn't have posted on social media. But that didn't change the fact that she tried to steal a guy from another woman. She said she was going to spread the fact on her social media, and also she wasn't going to see you again. No way. The arbitrator then said, "We are done here." I shook hands with her and walked out of the room, leaving a pale-faced John. I heard about John and his mistress from my private detective later on. Instead of getting sympathy from her followers, she was bashed about her adultery when the truth came out. People close to her also found out, and it became too uncomfortable to stay at work anymore. No one knew where she moved to, but her previous apartment suddenly became empty. John couldn't come up with a sum for alimony and spousal support after all. So he sold the house and moved to a small apartment. As a result of never helping with housework, his life was disheveled. His appearance became filthy, and the smell of garbage leaked out of his apartment. As a result, his colleagues stayed away from him, and his bosses were disgusted that he was demoted and moved to a dark corner of the office. From what I had heard. It sounded like he'd be working even after his retirement. As for me, I managed to find a job in a small hospital near my parents' house. Having 20 years of blank on the job is huge. Although I struggle with the latest equipment, I'm blessed with kind colleagues, and I'm living a fulfilling life. The alimony was used to renovate my parents' house for their future. I'm supposed to inherit it anyway. Above all, my parents, who are getting older, will have a difficult time if it remains as it is. It's an old single-story house, but my parents were overjoyed when the interior was redecorated and became cozier. The cost of the private investigation had reduced my savings, but I don't regret it. 
I can still work hard and make money again. I want to buy a car for the convenience of commuting and shopping when I save up enough money. Of course, if I have a boyfriend in the future, I won't use the car for anything other than its intended purpose. My husband and his mother went on a trip to Hawaii and left me and our daughter. It would be a waste of time to save money for a girl who will not even be an heir. My mother-in-law and my husband did not feel bad for the fact that they went on a trip to Hawaii with the money they had withdrawn from our child's school savings account. I had run out of patience and declared, I'm getting a divorce. My relatives were furious when they heard that. We all stormed into my parents-in-law's house, but there an even more shocking fact was revealed. I am Rachel, a 31-year-old office worker in a dual-income family. We have a family of three, my husband Daniel and our daughter Mia. Daniel and I were high school classmates and married upon graduation from college. Mia was born during our second year of marriage. Mia is now seven years old and in the first grade of elementary school. My in-laws live in a neighboring state. Daniel is their second son, but his brother, the eldest son, lives a few hours away. My mother-in-law said that my brother-in-law who left my parents-in-law's house was a heartless person and doted on Daniel, her second son. Daniel had been neglected because he was the second son, and he had been compared to the eldest son who was superior in every way. So when the eldest son moved away from the family, his mother changed her attitude. My mother-in-law interferes in our house at every opportunity and she has an ill attitude toward me. She does not seem to think well of the fact that our child is a girl. Rachel? Daniel is the second son, but we plan on having him become the heir of our family. So you need to have a son so that he can take Daniel's place in the future. She would say this to me constantly. She would even say this right in front of Mia. So I told her, please don't say these kind of things in front of Mia. I asked my mother-in-law. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not that Mia isn't cute. But once she gets married, she'll leave the family. This is why we need a son to keep this family alive. I couldn't get anywhere with her. Mia cried as she listened to this conversation. Am I not needed because I'm going to get married one day? Does that mean I have to say goodbye to mommy and daddy when I get married? She would ask me. That's not true. You can still hang out with us, even once you're married. You are our little treasure. I told her that, and I hugged her tightly. I talked to Daniel about this. My brother has left the house because his wife insisted. As the second son, I have to take care of mom. And she's right. Woman will leave someday. So I have to have a son and raise him to be a strong heir. I couldn't get through to him at all. One day, when I was worrying about such things, my mother-in-law called me with a happy look on her face. I bought a new car, and it was delivered today. I want to show it to Daniel, so I'll drive over there today to visit him. With that said, my mother-in-law was to come to our house when Daniel came home. Daniel came home before my mother-in-law did. Your mom told me that she bought a new car, and it was delivered today, I told him. Oh! It finally arrived. I saw it once at the car shop, and it looked really cool. Daniel, you saw the car? Yes, I did. I went with her to see it. It cost quite a bit of money, but I'm glad I got the loan. What? What do you mean? I was the one who bought my mom a car. I had to borrow some money, though. Why? You didn't talk to me about this. Well, you would have been against it if I talked to you about it. Of course I would. We need to start saving for Mia's future. Just as we were about to argue, the doorbell rang, announcing the arrival of my mother-in-law. I guess we'll continue this later. I can pay for it within my allowance, and it won't bother the family budget. I want to be filial to my parents too. I apologize for taking out a loan without consulting you, so please, forgive me. I was not convinced, and we ended up talking about this issue. I thought about talking to my father-in-law about it, but when I visited my parents-in-law's house, he was mostly out of the loop. 
Above all, I didn't have any father-in-law's contact information, and even if I wanted to visit their house, it was impossible to know when my mother-in-law would be gone. Although the pressure from my mother-in-law to give birth to a baby boy did not change, I was spending my days peacefully without any major events. My mother-in-law visited me without notice about twice a month, usually on Daniel's day off. After my mother-in-law made a sarcastic remark to me, Daniel and her went out together in the evening and did not return until morning. I wondered what Daniel was doing on his day off, spending all day with my mother-in-law. I was concerned, but I was working from home on my days off to compensate for Daniel's extravagance, and I thought he was taking his mother out of the house, who was toxic to Mia as well. I let this go, thinking this was for the best. I couldn't even take a proper vacation, and I felt bad for Mia. I worked hard every day to try to make ends meet. However, just before Mia started elementary school, something shocking happened. It was one day at the end of the year, one week before New Year's Eve. Daniel announced that he and my mother-in-law were going on a trip to Hawaii. The timing of this announcement was such that we could not even cancel the trip with a departure date just three days away. I was so surprised that I raised my voice and questioned Daniel about it. What are you thinking? You didn't even talk to me about it, and on top of that, going on a trip with just your mother? Well, mom's health has been getting a little worse lately, and this may be the last time we travel overseas. Mom really wants to go to Hawaii for New Year's Eve. Why doesn't your mother and father just go themselves? Didn't you at least think of taking me and Mia with you? No, because with my allowance, I can only afford tickets for me and my mom. Daniel's slurred answer left me with no energy to speak. We didn't speak for the rest of the day, and the next day, I told him. I'm spending the New Year's holiday at my parents' house, so you go enjoy Hawaii. I took Mia back to my parents' house. However, I was not convinced that Daniel's allowance would be enough to cover the travel expenses for the two of them. So, I decided to take various documents related to the family finances back to my parents' house and examine them. I checked the bank statements, the mortgage of the house, and my own premarital bank account, but there was nothing suspicious at all. However, there was no evidence of money being withdrawn from Daniel's account either. I thought it was unlikely, but I checked Mia's school savings account. My worst fears were correct. Daniel had cancelled Mia's tuition deposit. My outrage was so severe that I decided to divorce Daniel on the spot. I explained the situation to my uncle, who is a lawyer, and has just come to my parents' house for New Year's holidays. I asked him for advice about divorce. I'm sorry, uncle. I didn't want to bring it up at a time like this. What's wrong? Did something happen? Is your husband not with you? About that, he's currently on a trip to Hawaii with his mother. He said they wanted to spend the New Year's in Hawaii together. What about you and Mia? We were left behind. He said he could only afford two tickets. What the hell? He left behind you two and went on vacation with just his mother? <laughs> yes. And on top of that, the money for the trip came out of Mia's tuition fees. I don't want to be negative, but Rachel, you should divorce a man like that. Yes, I think so too. But I don't know the law. I was wondering if you could help me. Of course. Leave it to me. But I'm not a divorce lawyer, so I'll ask my wife to help me. My uncle and his wife are both lawyers, and my uncle's area of expertise seems to be business management. I asked my aunt, who is a lawyer with a strong background in divorce matters, to help me. I heard from my husband. Leave it to me. Let's punish him thoroughly. She became a very reliable ally. I proceeded with the story in more detail. I told her about my mother-in-law's car, which she had bought with Daniel's loan. We decided that we should do some research on our family's financial situation. Now, my other uncle, who is an accountant, joined in. Anyway, the three of them were more determined than I was to punish Daniel and my mother-in-law. I apologized repeatedly, saying, I'm sorry I put you through all this on New Year's. What are you talking about? You know what happens when you make enemies of a family like ours at a time like this. I'm going to make sure 
they pay. My aunt laughed and patted me on the back. Yes, that's right. There are many lawyers, accountants, and judicial scriveners in my family. After New Year's, we waited for Daniel and my mother-in-law to return back home. After the New Year's holiday, all the relatives decided to storm into my parents-in-law's house and confront them with the divorce papers. On the day of the operation, Daniel and his mother-in-law had already returned back home. We found out that Daniel and his mother-in-law had already returned back home, and were spending time at my parents-in-law's house as I had expected. I called Daniel and headed to my parents-in-law's house. My parents, my lawyer, and my accountant, plus my brother, who does martial arts as a hobby, were there just in case something happened to us. This large group of eight people went to my parents-in-law's house. Happy New Year! I came here today to discuss my divorce from you, Daniel. I'm here to discuss it with your parents as well. What a way to start the year! I told you I'm sorry for being selfish. That's about the trip you took with your mother, isn't it? <laughs> Daniel, where did you get the money from for your travel expenses? What? From my allowance. <laughs> You're lying. You canceled Mia's tuition fees without permission, didn't you? You went there with that money, didn't you? <gasps> How do you? Don't just show up here with all these people and say whatever you want. My son doesn't need a wife like you. You're never going to have a baby boy, anyways. You took most of Daniel's salary for the girl, and it mostly went towards her tuition, right? So it's none of your business what he does with it. My mother-in-law interrupts me. With all due respect, the salaries of two married people become joint property. It can't belong to only one of them. To my lawyer uncle who defended me, my mother-in-law says, "Shut up, you outsider!" She yells. Before my aunt could open her mouth to say something in reply, my father-in-law, who had been airing his grievances for so long, spoke up. Enough! I already know everything. I didn't think you would go this far. You're selfishly using the money from your grandchild's future. We're getting a divorce too. Daniel, you will inherit nothing. What? What's wrong with you all of a sudden? Yeah, honey, it's all their fault. No, it's not. They did nothing wrong. In fact, I'm really sorry for all the pain we've caused you. Saying this, my father-in-law apologized to me. Hey, honey, pull yourself together. You're the one who needs to pull yourself together. I told you, I know everything. Did you have a good time in Hawaii, having fun with the younger men, with all that money that was meant for our grandchild? Finally, my father-in-law shouted loudly and pulled out a few pictures from his pocket. There was my mother-in-law at the airport, arm in arm with a young man. Next to him was Daniel, holding hands with a woman. Wh what is this? I don't know anything about this. No. This is all a misunderstanding. Daniel and his mother had been using Mia's tuition money to go on double dates with their lovers. They even went to Hawaii. In fact, at New Year's, my uncle contacted my father-in-law to inform him about my divorce. My father-in-law, upon hearing the news, apologized in tears and told us that he too was divorcing his wife. And that he was going to liquidate his property so that he would not give it to Daniel and my mother-in-law. He told me that he wanted the property to go to his eldest son and daughter-in-law, and his granddaughter Mia. When my mother-in-law and Daniel went out together, they didn't come back until morning. They told me that they had gone out together to a bar area, and then went to their favorite bars. I told my aunt and uncle about this too. They said they wanted me to take care of the formalities over there too, using various methods. I had them put it all together for me. What misunderstanding? Treating your family like this? You're insane to go on an overseas trip and leave your family alone. I'm divorcing you, and I'm disowning Daniel. 
Wait a minute. Daniel and my mother-in-law, looking pale and desperate, pleaded with my father-in-law. My aunt, who is a lawyer, and my uncle opened their mouths. Unfortunately, we will not wait for you. We have a claim for alimony related to the divorce and a claim for usury. We are the ones who will be taking care of the request against the two of you. The sale of the house in your father's name will be completed next month. We are also proceeding with the property procedures. We have also contacted the eldest son, and we are planning to contact him in the future. He will take care of your father from now on. How could you? Why didn't you say anything? It's because you didn't listen to me. You bullied our eldest son's wife and kicked her out of this house. And now you're causing trouble for our second son's wife and her child. Don't you know anything about shame? I've spoken with my sister-in-law. She also says she doesn't want to have anything to do with you guys. She agreed to this conversation on the condition that we completely distance ourselves from you. Alimony for Daniel's of hair, child support for Mia, and refunds for spending money from the family budget. It's going to take a lot of money, and we will make sure you pay it in full. Rachel, listen to me. Listen? You've done so many selfish things without telling me, and now you want to tell me what? You have your mother, and your lover. Anyway, I don't want to see or hear from you ever again. Just stay out of my life. No! What about Mia? A child needs a father. She needs a father, sure. But it's not you. A man who neglects his family and spends all their money. I can't call someone like that a father. I said these words and left my parents-in-law's house. The rest was taken care of by my remaining relatives. When I was about to leave my in-law's house, Daniel chased after me. My brother and cousin seized Daniel when he grabbed my arm and dragged him back into the house. This was the last time I saw Daniel. Later that day, the divorce was finalized, and a little later, I received news that my ex-father-in-law sold his house and rented a small house in the town where my ex-brother-in-law and his wife live. I heard that my ex-brothers-in-law were actually going to take them in their home, but my ex-father-in-law said, I couldn't stop my wife from picking on our daughter-in-law. I couldn't ask you to take me in. I have money for my own retirement, so I will live comfortably on my own. And he declined their offer. However, the children at my ex-brother-in-law's place seem to love their grandfather. They always go and play at their grandfather's house after school and then go home. My ex-brother-in-law also seems to be enjoying this because his children could not see their grandfather because of my ex-mother-in-law. And my ex-brother-in-law's wife, my ex-sister-in-law, and I got to know each other through this one incident. We often get together during long vacations to let our children play with each other. The last time I saw Daniel was that day. Mia herself refused to see Daniel. When I was not around, my ex-mother-in-law and Daniel repeatedly said to Mia, If only you were a boy. Mia was traumatized by this. She was afraid that they would say such words to her again. So, she refused to see Daniel. When Mia grows up, she may want to see him again. But until she says that, I won't let Daniel see Mia. My ex-father-in-law sold his house, so Daniel ended up taking care of my ex-mother-in-law. They are living together in the house where our family used to live. However, since we were both working, taking in my ex-mother-in-law who has no job has meant that the family income has gone down while his expenses have gone up. My ex-mother-in-law started working part-time at a local supermarket. Daniel also started working part-time at night. The reason I know this is because a neighbor witnessed this and was a good friend of mine, contacted me to ask what happened. I explained the whole thing to him. I don't know what happened after that, but in that neighborhood, I'm sure they're struggling to survive. Furthermore, it seems that my mother-in-law had fallen in love with a young man and had even borrowed money to pay him off. She is now piled with debt. According to my aunt, they will both go bankrupt before long. I rented a house near my parents' house and live with Mia. My brother and parents love Mia very much and often take her to play with them on holidays. My brother, who is a bachelor, said, I'm not thinking of getting married at all and I don't want to have children of my own. 
But I don't know if it's because of that, but Mia is really cute and I would do anything for her. He takes Mia to his work barbecues and lets Mia play with children her own age. I once asked Mia if she misses her father. Even though I don't see him, I don't miss him at all because I have uncles, grandparents, and grandma, she said. Of course, I think she is being nice to me even though she is a child. When I saw Mia and my brothers coming home exhausted on holidays, I was reassured that Mia will not be unhappy because of her father's absence. And recently, my brother has been asking me if there is anyone good enough for me. I asked him about it and it seems that he wanted to introduce me to a single guy who works with my brother. He seemed to take an interest in me at a barbecue. My brother told me, He's a really nice guy, but he can't have kids of his own. That's why he can't get married, and he can't even be in a relationship. He liked you a lot. I can vouch for his character, and I'll take responsibility if anything happens to you. We are planning to go out for dinner next time. I still don't have the courage to take a new step forward in terms of marriage and love, but I would like to move forward with Mia in a happy new life with the support of those around me.